Hello and good morning. Uh, my name is Marcus Van Amsik, and uh, I will talk today about interpolations and mappings with applications to image processing. All right, let me just go right to the start here and uh, talk about uh, quickly the outline. Um, the outline will be as follows. Uh, to begin with, I'll talk quickly about interpolation and uh, approximation basics in case uh, that's not your cup of tea currently, uh, just to get the, uh, the foundation. And then I'll be talking about, uh, well, do a quick review about uh, interpolation in the Wolfram language, uh, just to point out what commands are involved. And then I come to um, the new stuff. Uh, it's so new, it's not going to be in uh, version 12.2, unfortunately. Uh, it's going to be about radial basis functions and thin plate splines. Uh, that's an interpolation method eventually to uh, do uh, yeah, interpolations on irregular samplings, uh, be it now any kind of measurement or in particular uh, image processing. And uh, at the end, I'll be applying these uh, interpolation methods to image warping and image registration. All right, so um, just to get started, I quickly define here a set of um, data points, uh, X data, so just the positions from one to 10, some uh, values uh, from one to, uh, not from one to 10, but on these uh, locations. And then uh, also for later use, uh, the derivatives of these data points, just in case I have those. So if I were to uh, depict that quickly in a plot, uh, this would be uh, a depiction of the data uh, ranging from one to 10 with derivatives and values. Okay, so um, I'll be using these kind of data, uh, this data set uh, through the entire talk. So you'll be, uh, it will be reoccurring. Okay, up front, a quick uh, distinction between what's interpolation and what's approximation. Uh, interpolation you basically have if you have a discrete set of data points and you construct a continuous function that passes through all the data points. Uh, that can be a rather crude approximate, uh, interpolation, sorry, um, when you just do a, a constant, uh, so basically uh, taking the floor function or a linear approximation or interpolation, I should say, here, quadratic, cubic, all the way up to uh, high polynomial interpolations, uh, just to give you an idea. So that's interpolation if the function that I come up with goes through the data. If that's not the case, then I'll be talking about approximation, and uh, that's going to be just a sidekick for this talk. Um, approximations, for example, would be a linear regression where you just try to get some kind of model, some kind of function with lots of parameters as close as, uh, as close as possible to the data set. So if you were to fit a, a, a parabola to this data, that's how it looks like. And you note that that uh, function does not go through the data points. All right, so we'll be talking mainly about interpolation. Um, okay, so what's so difficult or hard about interpolation? And uh, for that purpose, I'd like to address right away the nyquist shannon sampling theorem, which says that you have to sample a signal or any kind of data for that matter at a rate uh, that is about twice or more the rate than the highest frequency in the data. And you can see that very nicely here in this uh, uh, little manipulate. Uh, I have here uh, just a sinusoidal wave, which I sample. I can change here the frequency. Um, and uh, here that's just interpolation order. So if I push the interpolation order all the way up, I get a very nice interpolation, except though that if the sampling rate is too low, even a good um, interpolation won't do it because I may, may just sample the signal uh, in a very unfortunate way, as you can see here. Uh, it can, you can have more ray effects, <coughs> the ringing effects that uh, basically the two frequencies, uh, they modulate each other. Or, uh, well, if you basically push uh, the sampling rate to about half the highest uh, frequency of your signal, you see that the interpolation gets rather nice. Uh, and basically, as, as soon as the interpolation is about twice or more the highest frequency, uh, the, the sampling rate is about uh, uh, twice or more uh, the highest frequency in your signal, you do okay. So this was just um, kind of a depiction to quickly get that idea across. If I were to uh, give you a mathematical underpinning of this, I would resort to Fourier space. Um, now, I won't explain Fourier transformation, uh, just a few properties of Fourier transformation. First, if I would take, for example, a cosine signal and um, send it to Fourier space, 
I get here two de direct delta uh, spikes essentially with uh, some complex phases. And uh, as you can see, if I change the frequencies of the signal, I basically move these spikes outward or inward. Nothing much happens really. It's just uh, moving in and out. They don't move as much. And if I basically change the phase of the cosine, uh, if I move basically the wave, translate that, you see that uh, the signal or the spectrum in uh, the Fourier space does not move at all. It's essentially invariant under translations or the spectral states here are eigenstates under translation. Now that's pretty handy to have and that's why it's nice to work in Fourier space if you do interpolation because essentially what you do in interpolation is you know the values at a given position and you want to move or translate a little bit to the side and see what the value uh, is there. Now, if you're working in a space where translation doesn't really kick in, it only basically gives you a complex phase factor, then that's already a good sign. So that's why we address uh, Fourier space. Then there is another aspect of Fourier space, and that is if you have a Dirac comb, or if you're talking about temporal data, a spike train, so that you basically just have uh, high values every other step, uh, well, basically you know, step size uh, h, uh, then that spike train, uh, the sum of deltas, uh, the Dirac comb, which by the way has this very, uh, well, interesting uh, sign or letter. I'm not sure if that has a, uh, an analog in any kind of alphabet. If you know that by chance, please let me know by the chat. Okay, if that uh, uh, Dirac comb or um, signal, a spike train, if that gets translated into Fourier space, you also get a Dirac comb or a spike train except that the spacing is going to be uh, reciprocal. That means if the spacing here in position space gets bigger, the spacing uh, of the uh, uh, comb gets uh, smaller in the Fourier space and vice versa. So if I sample very densely here with the spike train in position space, I basically have a very sparse uh, comb here in Fourier space and vice versa. So let's keep that in mind. One other aspect about Fourier, is that uh, if you have a signal, or we just take a Gaussian here uh, for simplicity, and if I convert that into Fourier space, usually if it's well focused, the signal uh, has a nice position um, in the position space. If it has sh sharp edges, you usually have a very broad uh, spectrum in Fourier space. And if everything is smeared out in position space, you usually have a very strong spike uh, in uh, Fourier space. So just that uh, to keep in mind. Now let's assume we want to uh, sample now the signal, which just happens to be the uh, Gaussian distribution, but it could be anything. Um, if we want to sample that, well, essentially what we do is we just multiply that with a spike train with the uh, Dirac comb. And then we end up with just the values of this uh, uh, Gaussian uh, distribution on the integer or whatever positions the comb has. So we can do that. And if we do that, we uh, basically get here a kind of a discrete regular sampling of my signal. And uh, since uh, a sample uh, multiplication in position space translates to a convolution in, uh, uh, in Fourier space, you can just uh, convolve now uh, the uh, signal that you had in our case, the uh, Gaussian with the comb and you essentially get replicas of your signal in frequency space. Now that's all good and nice uh, as long as uh, these things don't overlap because if I now uh, reduce the, oh sorry, I reduce the sampling in position space, you see that the sampling points, they move uh, outward. On the other hand, the uh, signal here, uh, the replicas, they start to overlap. And that's, by the way, then a good sign uh, for uh, what's called aliasing uh, effects that you don't want because at the end of the day, you want to reconstruct just the center signal here. As soon as these things overlap, you essentially have a signal here that you cannot uh, uh, take apart anymore. That's a sum of two uh, components that you can't take apart anymore. So what you like to have is you'd like to make sure that uh, your sampling is uh, in such a way that the signal here in the spectrum and its replicas are well separated. Because if that's so, then um, let me move on. Then you can do the following. You can multiply the Fourier space just with a box or unit box a function that goes basically from uh, one boundary of your replicas to the next. 
and then it just basically singles out just the center part, which was the original signal, and deletes all the replicas. Now, if you delete all the replicas and then do the inverse transformation, you should end up with the continuous signal. And interestingly though, here you essentially do a multiplication that again is now a convolution here, so that essentially you have to convolve the original signal in position space with the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform of the unit box. And that happens to be the sync function. So ideally, this simplifies just to the uh, signal itself in this uh, area. And that's then transferred, uh, transformed back. It's just the convolution of this discrete signal with the uh, sync function. Okay, and that's essentially the basics of uh, uh, resampling theory. Um, and uh, so all we have to do is basically find a kernel with which we convolve the discrete data. And uh, ideally that should be the sync function, the sine of x divided by x, or rather the sine of pi x divided by pi x. Now, unfortunately, the sine of x divided by x has a very large extent. Uh, it goes from minus infinity to infinity. So numerically, that's not something uh, easy to convolve with. So uh, at the end of the day, we have to do a poor man's solution. We can do a linear spike. We can do some nice polynomial, in this case, a catmull rom uh, kernel, which is defined here. We can have the sync function uh, with some uh, signal uh, uh, signaling, signaling window, um, in this case, a Hamming window, and uh, cut it off somewhere. Or uh, we can do uh, uh, yeah, combined um, um, resamplings like the spline or the OMOMS uh, kernel, which essentially is a kernel that is finite and then combined with the, um, um, with the recursive uh, filter can be uh, made up into a pretty good approximation of the sync function itself. All right, um, so um, here we uh, have uh, in, in store essentially all the uh, samplings that you can choose from. Uh, just to give you an overview, these are all the available ones and then you can retrieve data about these samplings like the properties uh, the kernel, the Fourier kernel, and so forth. So uh, for the uh, OMOMS, um, OMOMS, by the way, stands for um, splines of maximal order and minimal support. So they are pretty efficient uh, to calculate and have pretty good quality. We have this spline function that we convolve with. And once we, uh, well, that is not the same function, but once we uh, add uh, the recursion filter on top of it, uh, we essentially de-blur it and then we get this uh, uh, um, effective uh, kernel. And at the end of the day, we then have uh, this kind of function with which we convolve the data. And that's pretty good. Uh, so uh, we can now also get uh, properties of that kernel. It is uh, continuous, but it is not continuous in its derivatives. You see little kinks here, by the way. Uh, which is bad if you want to take the derivatives of the resulting data, but uh, this happens to be, at least when it comes to reduction of noise, to be the best possible implementation. Uh, you can calculate the basic support, which gives you about uh, an idea about the efficiency, because the smaller the support of the kernel, the less calculations you have to do. All right, so, so much for the theory behind it, and uh, now also a little... Uh, it, uh, the entire thing in Fourier space. How does a uh, kernel in Fourier space look like? Ideal would be a box a kind of uh, structure, but you can see that uh, the, uh, this kernel already has a pretty box-like uh, spectrum, uh, and uh, uh, that's good in order to, uh, to basically uh, attenuate out all the replicas of the signal that you get due to the uh, uh, subsampling. All right, this would be just another plot and antenna at attenuation plot, sorry, it's a tough word for me. Um, and that gives you an idea how well you uh, subdue the signal outside the uh, center. Okay, let me move on. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, you can then also get the error kernel, which gives you an idea um, where the error of the approximation kicks in. Um, here, wherever we find frequencies, uh, under the blue shaded area, these frequencies would um, yeah, lead to an error in the approximation. Uh, so any signal that is somewhat here in the middle is fine. 
And then what's also a good uh, measure is to see by what uh, order you go up here on the side, uh, if it's a polynomial of second, third, fourth, fifth order, because that order detail determines how much or how fast you approximate the true function when you decrease the step size of your sampling. And in this case, you see uh, with OMOMs of uh, third order, I have uh, an approximation of fourth order at hand. Okay, uh, right, so let's apply this now. That was the theory, the dry stuff. Uh, so let's apply this quickly to image transformation. Where does it kick in here? It kicks in because uh, when you create a new image, uh, then essentially what you do is you take the inverse transformation, which takes the position back to the original image. And here you have to pick up the color of the image, which you basically get by interpolating between the pixel values that you have here. So that's where the interpolation kicks in. Um, so I can do this here with the image uh, perspective transformation. Uh, this uh, then, uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want. This is no rocket science. You can uh, rotate uh, your image, you can uh, translate, you can do whatever transformation you want, and then the resampling essentially gets you the image back. Now, what's interesting is that if we take, for example, very good quality uh, kernel that I just outlined, not just OMOMs of uh, third order, but they may be OMOMs of fifth order, the quintic order, you essentially get, as I pointed out already, a uh, very much sync-like kernel, so you should pick up the signal very well. Uh, and uh, we can just compare what happens uh, to image processing. So what I have done here, uh, quickly just show you the code, is I rotated the image in steps of 10 degrees, uh, and I do it once basically around, uh, and at the end of the day, 36 uh, uh, times 10 degrees is 360 degrees, so I rotate the image uh, back to its original position, but I do that in 36 steps, and in one case, I just take linear uh, resampling, in one case, I take Catmull ROM, which is a medium quality one, and then I take my OMOMS um, five. And uh, just to show you the quality difference, this is a linear transformation, and you see that errors accumulate while you rotate. Uh, this is when you do a one step better, Catmull ROM, uh, and this, for example, is a Quintic OMOM, and you can see essentially all the data, the fine, hairy stuff uh, at this end will can be reproduced, even if you do a transformation 36 times in a row. So there you see the quality gain that you achieve by uh, taking some interest into interpolation. Now, where does interpolation kick in um, for um, uh, in the mathematical language? Well, we have, for example, interpolation order when you do plots like a list line plot. You can interpolate uh, usually by default linearly, but you can also uh, determine higher order of interpolation, let's say quintic uh, or uh, cubic interpolation, zero order would be just a staircase, linear interpolation, uh, quadratic, cubic, and so on. So there you don't have to do anything, you just choose uh, uh, the appropriate option. Um, then we have another way to interpolate just discrete data if it's regularly sampled, and that is array resampling. Array resampling essentially takes a list or two-dimensional or four-dimensional, whatever dimensional array, and resamples that in a different step size. And there are two different schemes that I'd just like to point out because you could, for example, have a point sampling if your data was just always uh, sampled at a given point, then this would be the scheme to apply. However, if your data was basically sampled in little bins, then uh, taking a different step size and so on as a different positioning uh, scheme uh, where you want to read off the interpolating function. So uh, array resample comes with a point or bin uh, um, resampling scheme, which you specify here in the third argument. Uh, in this particular case, I take my data, resample it by a factor of four, uh, you know, higher sampling, and I do just a cubic sampling, so that looks like this. The red dots were the original data points. The blue ones are the ones that I now added. Um, what's also uh, of uh, some importance to some people is that array sample comes with all kinds of paddings. So uh, you cannot just do uh, a padding that, uh, for example, does uh, uh, yeah, a null padding at the side or a fixed padding, a reflective padding. You can do any kind of padding, uh, also a periodic padding. And then you get here the slightly different behavior on the ends of your uh, domain, interpolation domain, because here essentially the signal has to go up again to meet the, uh, uh, the last point here. 
Okie dokie. So that's uh, if you want to quickly sample uh, just um, uh, yeah, an array. Otherwise, if you sample any data, you can also just create the interpolating function itself. And that's done by interpolation or list interpolation. And what you get back is not now an array, but you get a container interpolating function container back. Uh, and with that, you can, uh, well, do any kind of plot as well. This thing behaves pretty much like a function. Uh, here, for example, uh, the Hermite interpolation uh, of my data set. Now, if you wonder, ever wondered why this has these funny shapes, that's because, well, just look it up, uh, the kernel of Hermite interpolation, interpolation when it's even of an even order has usually a very weird shape. And that's very intuitive. So that may be uh, misleading a little bit. Um, the nice thing about Hermite interpolation, though, is that you can also apply that to data where you have derivatives so that you not only fit the absolute value of the data, but also, sorry, also the, uh, uh, the derivatives that you may have at hand. And then you get an interpolation that looks like this here. So also up to higher orders, if you like. All right. Okay, last but not least, um, the interpolating function itself has some nice properties. Once you have interpolated something, it can, for example, do a Taylor expansion. You can uh, take derivatives or you can integrate. So this thing really behaves very much like an ordinary function in Mathematica. And because that's so, any function, a numerical function that has to return a function like structure, like NDSOL, for example, does take advantage of it. It does not return a discrete set of points uh, to approximate the function that you try to solve for, but it returns, as you can see, an interpolating function. Um, that not only holds true for uh, 1D, in this case, for, by the way, you see it is a Hermite polynomial third order. It's not periodic, but you can also do that for 2D, for example, here. Uh, uh, differential, uh, partial differential equation on a disk. And when you look more closely here, you see that uh, this is a method that's called unstructured. And what happens here is essentially that this thing, this is a prox uh, the, uh, the function being plotted, basically utilizes the finite element methods that are built into NDSolve, and it defines the approximation on this uh, uh, element, on this finite element grid. And every node now has a point and in between you have in this particular case, a quadratic uh, second order uh, interpolation. Now, in case you didn't know, and I have to admit, I didn't know because it sneaked in with version seven, I believe is uh, that you can also use that or utilize that in, in uh, interpolation for cases where you don't have a regular sampling of your data. Now, um, I assume here, I basically quickly generated on the fly, the height values around Mount Everest. And of course, you may not be, uh, not every point on that mountain may be accessible. So you most likely have an irregular uh, uh, set of data points. Uh, you can get the neighborhood relations by a Delaunay mesh. And that's exactly what happens, by the way, here in interpolation, uh, which unfortunately can only do for that mesh up to first order. Uh, and that generates an interpolating function that is defined on that mesh and that can reproduce here the data in a continuous form. So this would be how the Mount Everest looks like under this measurement. Now you see that this is not great. So there are better ways to do it. Uh, and for that matter, let me move on, on uh, to the next topic of uh, my talk and that is radial basis functions or uh, in the particular case that's most uh, popular thin plate splines. Now, in this kind of a pro, uh, interpolation scheme, you work as follows. You have this kind of function that you try to fit uh, to the data points. You have an affine, uh, uh, essentially transformation of function with a matrix linear part and a constant offset, uh, which basically, if you look at, for example, just the one-dimensional case, when you have points P1 that you'd like to map to Q1, Q2, and so forth, uh, that you basically approximate uh, the first mapping by just a linear mapping. And then you take care of all the nonlinear deviations and to do that by a weighted sum of radial basis functions, essentially functions that just basically measure or depend on the difference between the anchor point that you're looking at and the point that you try to project to. Uh, and they are just radial dependent uh, phi's. And for special uh, cases of these, like the thin plate spline radial basis functions, you get interpolations with a pretty good property. Uh, I won't go into the detail how you calculate the W's, uh, A and B is easy, um, 
the nice thing about these things is they don't only work for one dimensional to one dimensional mappings, but they work for all kinds of mappings. So they work for mappings from 2D to 2D, from 1T to 2D, from 2D to 1D, uh, to any dimension you like. And for image processing, it's an interesting case that you have 2D to 2D because that way you can uh, uh, construct warping uh, transformations from one set of discrete points to another set of discrete points. And that's exactly what we're going to try now. Uh, and uh, the radial function uh, that I take into uh, account is a thin plate, thin plate spline function, uh, which has different versions for depending on what kind of dimensionality you're working in. In 1D, it's R cubed. In 2D, it's R squared log uh, of R. In 3D, it's just R. And uh, the nice property of this uh, set of thin plate spine uh, radial basis functions is that they minimize this functional. And this functional basically says, okay, I minimize the uh, uh, differences between uh, uh, my data points and my interpolation function. And uh, times the parameter, which basically then uh, uh, determines the regularization, I minimize the curvature. So essentially, that's why they're also called splines. They minimize the curvature of the fit. Okay, having said that, uh, let's just generate here the radial basis transform um, of uh, the data. This function, by the way, is not yet in the system. It is attached to this notebook, which you can obtain after this talk uh, via Pathable. So this generates uh, a radial basis transform, which eventually will be an interpolating transform, but uh, that is uh, not decided yet uh, when it comes to the design decisions. And uh, so this radial basis transform, depending on what lambda is, will try to get a very smooth uh, function through the data set with more or less curvature. Now the two-day case, uh, the 1D case is not the interesting one. Let's address the 1T to 2D case again, the height measurements around uh, Mount Everest. So uh, again, here the data set of uh, height measurements. And now I send that uh, through not interpol uh, interpolation, but radial basis transform. Um, and this again gives me now a transform that gives me all the heights. Again, I plot these heights and you can see that now I not only have a linear, but a quadratic uh, interpolation of all these height values and they give a pretty good uh, reproduction of uh, the altitude uh, of Mount Everest. Okay, another application. Another application here is the warping uh, of, uh, in this case, Mona Lisa. I just basically have here predetermined a few uh, points on the face of Mona Lisa. They are depicted here by very small red dots, which I'm not sure you can see. And those dots I can now move. Uh, that means uh, I thereby uh, define a radial basis transformation that maps the old dots into the new dots. And for example, I can pick the eye and pull the eye to one side. Or uh, I can give her a really good smile uh, and you can see, you can also do that with any kind of uh, photograph if you want to. So this is a great thing to have fun uh, with uh, the data at hand. Uh, one more serene uh, application is, for example, the warping or the morphology of uh, biological structures. For example, this is a skull of a German shepherd dog. This is the skull of a uh, British Bulldog, and you can see that they look quite different. But if you find the morphing map that take this skull to this skull, you see that they are not th that different at after all. All I have to do is I have to specify a few key points on one skull and uh, the corresponding key points on the other one. This gives me now a radial basis transform, which basically gives me the uh, yeah, transformation of the German Shepherd into a British Bulldog. And then we can compare those two skulls and you see that Essentially, they look very much the same. The lighting, unfortunately, is different on these two photographs, but uh, the morphology of the entire skull is pretty much the same. And last but not least, uh, to get done in time, um, here another application that would be image registration. Given I, uh, two images that have an overlap, I can try to find corresponding key points in the, um, in the uh, image here on the left and right. And this is what I get. Uh, so just to depict them, I have here all where these uh, violet little points are around this area and here, I have corresponding points. And those I can now just utilize 
to generate without throwing any point away as I do with perspective transformations. I can just create a radial basis transform that takes all these points into this and fills the transformation in between to make it a continuous transformation. And then I can take the original image, uh, sorry, the second image, warp it onto the original image, stitch them together, and just last but not least, I can also utilize some additional image processing in Mathematica that is in painting to fill the gaps uh, on the side to obtain a bigger image. All right, so this was a kind of a tour de force through uh, all the interpolation techniques that we have in the Wolfram language. Uh, next up, if you're interested in image processing, uh, object detection and recognition with Julio right uh, next. And later today, we have an office hour sound and vision at 10 a.m. Uh, Central Time uh, or whatever time zone you are in. So that's about two hours from now. Thanks for attending. Thanks for listening and bye-bye.